Thank you. The mic was not working. I tried like four times. Can I have your attention? And no one was paying attention. <laughs> I was a little frustrated, but then I realized mic is not working. My name is Beza Inala. I am a research fellow at Chatham House. And interestingly, I work on cybersecurity and nuclear power plants, civil nuclear power plants and nuclear weapon systems areas. And sometimes technology does not work. I have uh, three great speakers with me today, and they're going to be talking about communicating nuclear weapons. Uh, on my right, I have Oliver Barton, and then on my left, Ben Stanley and Jennifer uh, Knox. A um, couple of remarks, a couple of uh, things that I need to stress here. If the Wi-Fi is not working um, in, in your booklets, if you see and you, you couldn't uh, sign up to that, you need to uh, write U UK Pony 17, all capitals, that's the password that you would be using. Uh, if you can't, uh, you, you can't get on to the Wi-Fi, UK Pony 17. And I also want to uh, stress that all speeches and uh, prepared remarks are on the record and are attribu attributable to the individual and the event organized by Rusi. All comments made in response to the questions are off the record. This is the same for the previous uh, session and also the same for this one and the uh, upcoming sessions. So uh, be aware that speeches are on the record, but the questions and response are off the record. Uh, without further ado, I would like Oliver to start the uh, session. Um, I asked everyone to speak 10 minutes. I'm a little despotic in terms of uh, time, so in 10 minutes it's going to be over, and then we will turn to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in such a prestigious environment as this. Today I'm going to speak to you about the role of messaging, signaling, and strategic communications in preserving deterrence during peacetime and managing crises involving nuclear armed adversaries. In UK government circles, this is referred to as deterrent communications, or simply DETCOMs for short. Before... Before we get started, uh, disclaimer. Uh, the IT may not be Before sympathetic. Before we get started, maybe I'll introduce you. <laughs> that is something that I forgot, and the IT can solve that at the moment. Uh, so Oliver Barton is a principal analyst at the uh, DCLT, and he's studying his PhD at the London School of Economics on Britain, arms control, and transatlantic relations. Thank you. So a disclaimer. Whilst I work for the DSTL and support the UK nuclear policy community, all of the views expressed herein are but my own and do not necessarily reflect those of Her Majesty's government. So firstly, what are deterrent communications? Communications are one of the three fundamental principles of UK deterrent policy, the three C's, alongside credibility and capability. Why, why are communications important? Well, ultimately, deterrence is in the eye of the beholder, and it's not sufficient for us to believe our threats and incentives to be credible and capable. Our adversaries have to, too. Deterrence ultimately may fail if an adversary fails to understand one of three things. Firstly, what we as the deterrer don't want the adversary to do, and what we'd rather they do instead. Uh -huh. Secondly, what harm we are willing and able to inflict upon them if the adversary doesn't comply with our wishes. And thirdly, why it is ultimately in an adversary's interest to comply. Deterrence communications are the vital means of ensuring that the adversary understands those three things and that our credibility and capability has the necessary impact upon their decision making. Debt comms form a fundamental part of any deterrent strategy during both steady state and would be a vital tool in any nuclear crisis. Nonetheless, the topic is often overlooked in the academic literature and at least historically has not been a very prominent part in many nuclear weapons states' policy and doctrine. And we can elaborate on that in questioning. So what, what are debt comms? Well, I think it's worth, it's worth starting with a definition. I'd suggest the following. It involves the use of all means of communication, whether that be words, actions, or images, to prevent nuclear blackmail or aggression by influencing the attitudes, behavior, 
and ultimately the decision making of potential adversaries. In an ideal world, debt comms would live up to a certain, some certain standards. First, they would be integrated. Strategic communications should never be an adjunct. They should be at the very core of one strategy. In deterrence, that's particularly true. If, the, if your strategy cannot be communicated or comprehensible to your adversary, then it is simply going to be ineffective. Secondly, debt comms needs to be tailored. De deterrence is ultimately in the eye of the beholder, and each potential adversary will see and understand something different, and our communications need to be tailored to their specific needs and perceptions. All of this should be underpinned by systematic analysis, how the adversary thinks and how we can influence them. Our strategy should be balanced, balancing both threats and incentives where possible, and also balancing the needs of the multiple audiences to our communications. In any single event, we might be deterring one adversary in a crisis, but we'll have other potential adversaries looking on and taking note. Most importantly, our communications need to be comprehensible and compelling. It is not enough to communicate in terms that resonate to our own domestic audiences. They need to resonate and crucially change the thinking of the adversary. If they are in a crisis, they have already to some extent called one's bluff. You have to change their decision calculus. They need to be coordinated, they need to be integrated, they need to be evaluated and ultimately over the course of peacetime or crisis, they need to be adjustable to events as they unfold. That's the ideal. In the real world, all manner of factors will frustrate our ability to achieve those high standards. Firstly, we will never know enough, especially to satisfy senior decision makers who, at least in recent conflicts, have become used to an extraordinary level of insight, precision and control over, the, over an operation. And we have to be able to cope with, a, with the, and teach our senior decision makers to be able to cope with a certain irreducible degree of uncertainty and imperfect knowledge. They'll also have to labor under extraordinary time pressures, be subject to their own and the adversary's biases and stresses, a need to deter multiple adversaries simultaneously, a real ch challenge in controlling the narrative, particularly in a crisis. And crucially, a need to respond to others' messaging. Signaling, nuclear signaling is often sort of um, framed in the academic literature as almost a loud hailer. But it's a dialogue. And one needs to be able to respond effectively to the messaging that the, your, your adversary, who is equally trying to deter and influence you, will be sending. Today, we would likely need to have to cope with significant asymmetries, whether that be in capability, stake or risk appetite and we may be dealing with relatively immature deterrence relationships or, deter or relationships with emerging powers for whom in the UK's case at least we do not necessarily have a positive and rich history and all of this particularly in time of crisis will be frustrated by a climate of mistrust and minimal dialogue okay so that's the real world I mean given these high standards to which our debt comms ideally should aspire but the real world challenges that will frustrate our efforts in practice, where on earth do we start in trying to construct debt comms? Well, I'd, I'd offer two things. First is humility. One can only try so hard and achieve so much. Second, analysis. These real world challenges can be managed if not entirely overcome by focusing and our, under, and our, our intelligence collection and our assessments on understanding our adversary. What is pushing them and pulling them back from the brink? This understanding will allow us to tailor our communications more effectively. And the aim is ultimately to reduce the perceived benefits of aggression and cost of restraint to the adversary and increase the perceived costs of aggression and benefits of restraint to them. And that can be illustrated in the form of a very simple framework that one can construct. Firstly, one has to consider, from the adversary's perspective, what are the benefits and costs they see of aggression? One then has to flip it over and look at restraint. What's, what's holding them back? And having done so, one can start to identify those factors, motivations, and perceptions that we should be positively influencing on the right-hand side because they will enhance deterrence, 
and those which should be trying to diminish in the minds of the adversary because they'll undermine deterrence. Okay, enough of the theory. Uh, Christina asked me to give a practical illustration to, sh to illustrate how this would work. Now, this is very, sim very simple and with the benefit of hindsight. But looking at, say, the Falklands conflict on the cusp of the Argentine invasion, one can start to identify some of the, the motivations that were influencing the hunter's decision-making, whether that be the perceived benefit of an invasion being the reclaiming of lost territory, or the perceived cost of restraint being appearing to appear weak, or even undermine their own regime's instability. Ultimately, the details are sort of neither here nor there. It was the factors on the right-hand side of this model that were going to enhance deterrence, and the ones on the left-hand side that were under, going to undermine it. As it turned out in that particular situation, deterrence failed because the UK failed to communicate factors that would have changed that decision-making calculus. Ultimately, the UK failed to communicate what we didn't want the adversary to do, the price we were ultimately prepared to pay to change their thinking, and why ultimately it was in the adversary's interest to show restraint. A certain amount can be achieved through the analysis of historical case studies we've heard this morning, and we can derive lessons for guiding future action. But there is no substitute for our policymakers, at least, for practical experience. Now, thankfully, practical experience of managing a nuclear crisis is few and far between. But we can substitute that, in a way, through experiential learning and exercising. And at least in the UK context, we run a series of annual, uh, very regular tabletop exercises in order to sensitize both ministers and senior officials to the challenges. These exercises have a number of aims. First, to ex actually explore the role of signaling and messaging in managing crisis situations. Secondly, to provide that experiential learning of which I spoke. And thirdly, to identify any gaps or deficiencies in policy or plans. And the outputs to date have been significant. They've provided useful clarification in roles and responsibilities and exposed assumptions that may not hold true in, in fast-evolving situations. And they've derived specific recommendations for how the UK can do better. I can elaborate further on these in questioning, but some of the findings of these exercises to date have been striking. Firstly, the need to develop strategies in advance, both for your steady state peacetime communications and for any potential crisis, and that these should be tailored to those countries and actors and actions, crucially, we worry about most. Secondly, all these strategies need to be underpinned by more sophisticated analysis of our adversaries' decision-making than I showcased in that example. But we also need to actually have established the media and relationships for communications well in advance, um, such that our communications would be comprehensible and compelling, but also crucially get through to the people we need to hear them in time of crisis. And in doing all of the above, we need to consider the needs of all the other audiences to our messaging, not just the adversary, but other potential adversaries who've been watching but the international and our own domestic audiences who we'll be needing to reassure simultaneously. Now we get to the more practical things. These strategies need to be evaluated regularly. We need to learn from history, learn from practical case studies. We need to coordinate because it will be, if any crisis, will be a multilateral one. And we need to have very clear, documented and exercised processes for actually doing this for real. And ultimately, our communications said at the very beginning, need to be integrated at the very heart of our strategies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, it was very good, precise, 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, on my left is Ben Stanley. He's a safety assessor graduate at the UK Atomic Weapons Establishment and uh, he had completed his master's in University of London. Go ahead, Ben. Okay, hello. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the bomb today and what that means for us in the industry, in, in uh, policymakers, and for the general public. So a general disclaimer, the, the thoughts in this are of mine and mine alone and uh, are not representative of AWE or any other partners in the, or, or the UK government. Okay, so what does the bomb mean and when do we talk about the bomb? 
So when I talk, talk about the bomb, I mean the actual weapon itself, I mean deterrence and how that affects the general public. And uh, so do we talk about the bomb to the public and within ourselves? No, we don't. We talk about the bomb when we have a decision to make. And when we have a decision to make, whether it's renewal of Trident or we want to um, uh, discuss, uh, ask the Prime Minister what happened to a certain missile firing, uh, we don't actually talk to the public and say well, how it affects them and how um, this can feed into what they should be voting for or what they think that they should be concerned about. And when we do talk to them, are we talking the same language as they are? Do they understand what the policy language means and are they, do they understand what the engineering language means for them as well? And internal to the industry, how does this affect the knowledge transfer? If you've got an engineer talking to a policy maker or you've got uh, engineers who are perhaps at different stages in their career, can we make sure that that knowledge is transferring its way down the chain and then when it does transfer it down the chain, are we effectively passing it on to those who are concerned or should be interested in it? And how does it affect uh, the public understanding and how does it affect uh, the support for the mission as, uh, as other countries call it? And uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, what we could perhaps do about it. So, um, nuclear workforce. Uh, yes, we have the, the, the old guard transitional and the next gen. These fit roughly into our baby boomers, Gen X and millennials um, kind of categories. Uh, you've got those who uh, grew up in, in, the, in the kind of the, the height of the Cold War, those where there was lots of fun, there was lots of interest, there was lots of concern, there was lots of information about it. And then uh, kind of funding dropped off, interest dropped off. Uh, perhaps the, the issues remain the same, but uh, there wasn't as much um, perhaps uh, continual investment in what we should be concerned about. And now we have the, next, the new generation of uh, workers, whether they're engineers entering the industry, whether they're policy makers, or whether, or whether they're the public who are just kind of in the street wondering what they should be concerned about and who's telling them uh, the right issues which they should know about or they should be um, uh, perhaps learning more about in, in the future. Um, and is there a disconnect between these populations? Uh, are, are the extant population of uh, of, of, of engineers passing on this information to those who are younger, who are entering. Uh, you've got, uh, I was speaking to an American, he called them the Greybeards. They go off to uh, have a chat to someone who has got all of this information, who's got all of this expertise dealing with, um, with uh, situations, with, uh, with uh, scenarios which don't happen so more for, uh, for, for good reasons. Um, but um, are they able to pass on that expertise in an efficient manner to the new people who come in? So when they do uh, experience these, uh, these scenarios, these, uh, environments, are they able to deal with it uh, and learn from either the mistakes or what went right in the past? Um, so on the right you can see a general graph of what the nuclear industry looked like. They did a, a general poll of, uh, of the workforce. So you can see in uh, 2003, which is that, uh, that yellow line, which you can see up there, but I, I can't really see on here, it's got this great big spike in the middle, which uh, was going to slowly shift to the right as, pe as, the, as you got, had a more and more top-end heavy workforce within the nuclear industry. And uh, for many members of the nuclear industry, so it took this as a sign and we said we need to change how we are doing things, we need to change how we are looking at uh, recruiting people, how we are going to um, manage the information which we have. And so they, they realised they needed a lot of investment in getting new people in uh, and when they did get new people in, they need to transfer that knowledge across again to, the, to, to these early careers uh, members. So when we talk to the public, how do we talk to the public? Um, the UK has, a, has had a historical need to know. I still work with people who um, can remember when they didn't know what the person in the room next door to them was, was doing. They, uh, they had a very closed door policy. You, you knew what your job was and you didn't know what the next person's job was. And that was the same with the public. You were told what you needed to be concerned about. Um, and that has changed. We, we are much more open with it within, within the industry. We talk to within our own circles. We talk uh, to those who can affect us as policy makers. We talk to those um, we would advise those uh, who are in, in government of what, how, what we build or what we feed into, how that affects them and what they should be concerned about. Um, so, and we're getting better at talking to the general public as well. We have more technical outreach. Uh, we, we have a, um, we, we, uh, we have a, a, <coughs> a great big laser at work called Orion and we use this for a certain amount of time for academic research. We allow universities to come in and uh, to uh, use some of our, uh, share some of this expertise that we have at AWE to um, uh, feed into either their research or we can learn from them in turn and how that can kind of start that conversation going of what does this technology mean for us, how does it affect the wider kind of public, how does it affect academia and how can it affect those also working in the area. Um, when I was over in the US, as a slightly more anecdotal, they have a much more apparent kind of engagement with the general public. When they talk to the general public, uh, you might have a, a chap who, uh, 
um, who works in the Army or the Air Force or, or, or in the US Navy, and he'll be standing in the airport in his uniform, and a member of the public come up to him and go, so, um, what do you do? And, and they'll quite happily tell them, yes, I, well, I'm an ICBM operator. And the person, the member of the public go, well, what on earth is one of those? And they'll explain to him what, what a missile is, what a nuclear weapon is, how deterrence fits in, what NATO is, what it means to the US public, what it means for that person how deterrence can uh, affect not only the grand international scheme, but how it can affect those, um, the individual voter themselves and why they should be concerned about certain topics. So the way we talk about nuclear weapons perhaps is affected in how we are exposed to them and where, when we grew up. So in the past, um, we, had, we had an anecdote earlier about um, when he had an exercise in school and they said, if you see a nuclear weapon go off, you need to hide underneath your table and, uh, and, uh, and, and basically last it out. Um, we had a much more uh, polar world. We, we had the two, we had two superpowers. We knew who, in, in our eyes, who we thought the bad guys was, and we knew which side we stood on, and, mo and most people in the world knew that. Um, when we had signaling, it was very much a red line in, in, in a kind of being drawn. You had a Cuban Missile Crisis, you had a very clear cut, um, you must do X or we'll do Y, and, and from both sides understood what the, the options were at that time. These days we live in a much more polar world. We don't have a, a clear enemy. We don't have, we, everyone is an ally and an enemy and everyone is a potential uh, to turn into something different and we can, the way we reenact, with the way we um, engage with them and the way we engage as a pub, uh, with the public as well and how we change our, um, how, how we change our attitudes as well can very much affect the way that we talk to those as well. Um, going back to signaling, uh, how that's changed. We, in Crimea, um, we, have, we were told about signaling, we were told about the, the nuclear weapons that the, the Russians were, were potentially going up, and down, uh, going up and down the border with, but we didn't know from the government what potentially was going on. We heard about it from the media. We were told what to be concerned about by the media, but there was no clear what is actually happening or what our reaction is to, from the government. And, and those who did understand perhaps weren't aware exactly what the threat was and how it can affect them. Uh, either because they don't understand exactly what a nuclear weapon is or they don't understand what this means when a certain country does this. Um, we live in, a, in an information age. Uh, we get bombarded by information all the time. It's very hard uh, for lots of members of the public or, or even, even myself, if I'm str I struggle with this, wondering which bits of information are important to me. We are overloaded with information all the time. Um, and we also we sort of disassociate. Unless we have a keen interest in something, we don't always pay attention to it. Uh, unless it, we know it affects us, unless we know it's going to affect us soon, we won't, we'll perhaps say, okay, well, I'll, I'll pay attention to it later when it will, it will become an issue for me, when it will directly impact me. But until then, we, we just kind of say, oh, other people may be concerned about it, and I'll let them be concerned about it, I need to be concerned about it. So, I talked a little bit about knowledge transfer. If we're not transferring knowledge to um, our engineers throughout the ages, uh, throughout their careers, and we're not talking to the public, we're not talking to the policymakers, and so policy ma policymakers writing policy and they don't understand what the policy is in, a, in, a, in its physicality, what, what they're saying, well, I may be moving uh, Weapon X to base Y, but uh, what is exactly Weapon X? Do I know how it works? Does, does the member of the public even know how a nuclear bomb roughly works, and how does that affect the way that they're going to perceive a deterrent? How does that perceive the way that they're going to look at the policy, and how does that, how does that change the way that they're perhaps going to perceive the way that they should be taking an interest in certain things. Um, humans are quite emotive creatures. When we don't have the full facts, we, we, we uh, go with a gut feeling in a way. We, we, uh, when, if we don't have all the facts, we don't give the members of the public all the facts, they are going to start to uh, ex expand on their, uh, they're going to vote more emotively and be concerned about things more emotively if they, if they don't know exactly what certain things are. And so we can see it all along the entire spectrum as people either start to trivialize what a nuclear weapon is or they're going to, um, going to go the other direction altogether and take a more hardline approach so, and condemn them as well. And we can see a broad range of spectrum, but people are going to be choosing where they fit along that track a bit more emotively. So what should we do about it? Well, within the industry, uh, we need to engage with the public wider. We need to. Um, talk at all levels, whether it's government, whether it's industry, academia. I talked a little bit about uh, our layers that we have a work around, how we, we talk to universities and how we talk to students. Um, the industry within itself, we have professional development programs. We, we have a, uh, learn and lunch. You have all communities of practice, which you know within the industry. Um, government does go out and it does talk to people. It does tell people what it thinks it should be concerned about. But do we need to do more? Um, enhance outreach by facilities. Um, 
the people within it. It is as simple as what the Americans do when they have a member of, the, of, of, the, of, of their general staff. Do they go out and actually chat to the public? And is that something that we should be doing more of as, as engineers, as policy writers? Should we be going out and actually talking to wider than just your friends and family and telling people how it actually affects them? Um, and do we need a, bit, a peculiar British quote? Do we need to be less apologetic about the bomb? Like the Americans, do we need to perhaps not take certain pride in it, but realize that this is part of a, about what we have and what we are, and um, just be, uh, be uh, more accepting of where we are in the world and, and what deterrence means for us uh, as on a UK scale and, and for the person in the street as well. So I've, <laughs> I've talked a little bit about uh, what I thought, but uh, when I recently went to the Capstone Conference at Stratcom, and uh, one of their senior members of staff said, um, we've all thought about nuclear weapons, but um, has everyone else really? And that's something I kind of want to pose to you guys is, we all talk about nuclear weapons, we all talk about how that affects us, and we talk to the engineers, we talk to the policy makers, but do, does, the, do the, does the average person in the street know what we're talking about, and do they understand it in the same way that we do? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, the next speaker is Jennifer Knox, and uh, she had completed her Master of Philosophy in University of Oxford, and she's currently a research assistant uh, at Global Zero. Great, uh, thank you so much for welcoming me here today. A few years ago, I finished my graduate thesis on nuclear weapons free zones and other strange, unconventional forms of arms control. I'm here because happily for me, the nuclear ban has made that research a lot more relevant to the wider arms control community. Uh, the nuclear ban is just the latest in a series of fascinating and puzzling arms control initiatives. These initiatives do not rely on, and in many cases seem to openly flout, the participation of the major users and producers of the weapons they seek to prohibit. So in this presentation, I will be presenting a framework for thinking about this emerging subversive arms control model. Subversive arms control diverges from traditional arms control both in its aims and in the mechanisms by which it seeks to achieve those aims. Because the nuclear ban process is so polarizing, even in the disarmament community, I want to clarify that my intention in this presentation is not to advocate for or against the nuclear ban. Before that debate, I think it's really important that we understand what the ban treaty is designed to achieve and how it's designed to achieve it. My hope is that both ban skeptics and ban supporters will come away with something from this presentation. So first, I'll begin by more concretely defining the differences between subversive and traditional arms control. I'll look at arms control agreements that contain qualities of both approaches, namely nuclear weapons free zones. And then I'll analyze the fully subversive arms control agreements. Then we'll apply some of those examples to the nuclear ban, talk about expectations, uh, what we might uh, see out of this treaty, and how well this model will apply to the exceptional case of nuclear weapons. So traditional arms control is so familiar and so intuitive that we rarely sit down to think about its very fundamental characteristics. It occurs between states or in established international fora. Uh, the resulting agreements are designed to change or limit the behaviors of the parties to the treaty, uh, the people who sign on. Uh, for the most part, they tend to be limited to those relevant parties, either bilateral agreements or with a handful of parties and their mechanisms towards implementation are defined and rigorous. The agreement typically establishes formalized verification and enforcement regimes. Subversive arms control shares this facade, but underneath it camouflages a very different structure and purpose. Typically, subversive treaties emerge when efforts to come towards an arms control agreement are frustrated in traditional fora. The conventional path forward essentially is blocked. Uh, negotiators are seeking to change or limit the behavior of parties that have nothing to do with the treaty, essentially. Um, parties that have no expectation of ever joining the treaty, which is very different. Uh, they're broadly multilateral, which means you can expect dozens upon dozens, sometimes over 100 states to participate. The mechanisms towards implementation seem to be missing from these treaties entirely because they're normative. Uh, entry into force tends to be very weak, provisions are flexible to encourage greater participation, and there are little or no verification or enforcement mechanisms. Nuclear weapons free zones are a really interesting mix of these two approaches. In their non-proliferation objectives, they resemble traditional arms control. In their disarmament objectives, however, they're more subversive. 
depending on the urgency of those two objectives, they can fall on a spectrum between these two approaches. In the Latin American nuclear weapons free zone, for example, the risks of proliferations were, were considerably higher because of a nuclear rivalry between Brazil and Argentina, who didn't initially participate in the treaty. In the South Pacific, however, proliferation was a much more distant concern, and uh, really the parties were taking aim at French nuclear testing in the region. Uh, so with the Latin American example, you did have a dedicated verification and enforcement regime that was created by the treaties. Non-proliferation was much more of a focus. Nothing like that existed in the South Pacific nuclear weapons free zone. In terms of participation, these zones have actually proven to be highly successful. The weak entry into force mechanisms and the flexible provision on controversial articles like, uh, uh, um, sorry, peaceful nuclear explosions, uh, allowed porous zones to build uh, participation over time, eventually leading to full zonal cohesion. That was especially true in the Latin American case where it took decades for all of the regional parties to sign on to the agreement. Uh, nuclear weapon states were not allowed to participate in negotiations. They were not allowed to be party to the treaties. There were, however, additional protocols that they were allowed to sign on to to express compliance with the regimes but uh, nuclear powers active in the regions in question universally resisted the development of nuclear weapons free zones, and still today only a few relevant nuclear powers have signed on to the regions where they're active. Uh, nevertheless, there have been some interesting outcomes from these treaties. Uh, it's difficult to identify an ironclad causal chain between nuclear weapons free zones and changes in the behavior of nuclear powers. We're looking at a time scan of decades. Uh, there are a lot of relevant variables and there are very few cases. Nevertheless, I think it's worth pointing out that the participants of nuclear weapons free zones have gotten a lot of what they wanted when they set out to design these treaties in terms of changes in the behavior of nuclear weapon states, significant changes in patterns of nuclear weapon storage, nuclear weapons uh, transport, uh, testing obviously is a, a big victory, especially in the South Pacific. And even in the case of New Zealand, there have been changing regional alliance structures around uh, the use of nuclear weapons. So all of those outcomes uh, were not expected when these treaties were started. The general arms control community did not anticipate those kinds of successes. So we can see that the roots of subversive arms control go quite deep, quite early in the late 60s. Uh, but the fully subversive treaties emerged at the end of the 20th century. The first was the Ottawa process that resulted in a prohibition of landmines that entered into force in 1999. This was swiftly followed by a prohibition on cluster munitions that entered into force in 2008. Initially, both of these treaties were prompted by a failure to achieve progress in the conference and disarmament. Both treaties focused on a normative reframing of the weapons around humanitarian concerns. Both processes were rejected by the major users and producers of the relevant weapons class, and both proceeded anyway with broad multilateral support. So did the normative process work? Uh, the major users and producers of these weapons in question still are not participating in these uh, treaties. Nevertheless, there have been marked changes in state behavior in the short time that these treaties have entered into force. Since 1999, there's been a major decline in the use and production of landmines, as well as the destruction of 51 million stockpiled mines. Notably, this progress is both among parties to the treaty and among states that have refused to participate in the treaty, which is quite interesting. Results are slightly more mixed for the Convention on Cluster Munitions. Uh, there have been two episodes of significant use of cluster munitions in conflict since 2008. Uh, nevertheless, there has been a general decline in use and production. Stockpiles, 93% of global stockpiles have been destroyed. And some significant users and producers, most notably the United States, which has had nothing to do with the Convention on Cluster Munitions, uh, has changed its patterns of use, production, and stockpile. Uh, so. That's a pretty interesting result as well. Overall, these unconventional arms control agreements have really proven to pack a punch in the short time since they've entered force. Uh, their influence on state behavior is not limited to parties and is not reliant on formal verification and enforcement regimes. So what does this mean for the nuclear ban? It clearly belongs among the body of subversive arms control. It stems from the frustration of non-nuclear weapon states with weaknesses in the NPT regime and a failure to achieve new progress towards disarmament. It aims to regulate the behavior of states who have had nothing to do with negotiations and who will certainly not join the resulting treaty. It's broadly multilateral and will doubtless involve a majority of states in the international community. From these parallels, we can also make predictions about the mechanisms of a future ban treaty. 
I will say that as I was designing these slides, we were expecting the ban treaty draft to come out the next day, and I did hold on to them to make sure that these predictions held, but they did. Uh, so, so far, so good. Uh, we can expect weak entry into force, uh, flexible provisions for participation, broad and normatively framed aims, and nominative, normative um, verification and enforcement that doesn't really add to existing regimes. These qualities of the treaty have received a lot of early criticism, and certainly they would threaten a traditional arms control approach. I think it's worth pointing out, though, that in this case they aren't flaws to the treaty, they're the foundations of this model. That isn't to say that there aren't serious potential obstacles facing the nuclear ban process. Subversive arms control has achieved a lot of its aims in the case of landmines and cluster munitions, at least so far. That being said, nuclear weapons play a very different role, as we all know. Using norms to change the cost-benefit calculations for landmines and cluster munitions was possible because there were other weapons that became less costly alternatives that could fulfill a similar security function. It's much harder to see how that would be the case for nuclear weapons. Arguably, you could say that the United States, for example, could fill that security gap with conventional weapons. States like Pakistan certainly could not. So that's one major difficulty. Second, while nuclear weapon states Participation in the treaty is not a threshold for success, as is often argued on both sides of this uh, debate. The participation of ally states may prove to be much more important. These are the states best positioned to increase the costs of relying on nuclear weapons, and so far they've demonstrated little interest in the treaty process. Third, landmines and cluster munitions had received little scrutiny for their uh, humanitarian impacts prior to the Ottawa and Oslo process. The same can't be said for nuclear weapons, the use and possession of which is already heavily stigmatized, especially in the international community. My colleague Ben's comments sort of hinted at that as well. And similarly, the Ottawa and Oslo processes represented a watershed moment in civil society participation on their respective weapons issues. Uh, civil society and public pressure have advocated for the abolition of nuclear weapons almost since their conception, so it's not clear how much that measure is going to change cost, measure, cost calculations or how much stigmatization is really possible from where we already are. So I'd like to leave with a few concluding thoughts. Uh, though unconventional, I hope I've made a compelling case that subversive arms control does have an impressive track record when traditional fora are dominated by the interests of major users and producers of weapons classes. This may be the kind of unconventional arms control that we've sort of started talking about in some earlier sessions. It's certainly a new approach. Uh, most criticism and support regarding the nuclear ban, however, is based on expectations of traditional arms control frameworks, which isn't capturing the aims or the mechanisms of this treaty. To argue for or against a successful outcome, I, it's really important that we first establish what the intended outcome is and how it is being pursued. Finally, the ban does have significant obstacles that it will need to overcome. They just aren't the obstacles that critics tend to focus a lot of attention on. It will be very difficult to translate the success of earlier arms control treaties to nuclear weapons, which play a unique role in security and society. Well, thanks for your attention. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to open the floor to questions. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and uh, state uh, your affiliation and your name as well. I think there are a few questions. I saw an Andrea's hand first, so I'll just go all the way back and then I'll come here and then there. Hi, I've got a question for, uh, for Jennifer. You had a of an ICBM. They've similarly conduct, conducted testing that has implications for their ability uh, to have uh, components of their system re-enter their atmosphere under heat and pressure. These are technical developments that are uh, extremely concerning and which take North Korea further along their stated aim um, of being able to strike the continental United States with a nuclear weapon. We're going to talk a little bit about whether that is a sustainable and a stable future. And we've got two excellent debaters here to help uh, flesh out some of those arguments. Uh, speaking in 
favor of the resolution that it's possible to maintain a stable deterrence relationship with a North Korea that has the ability to hold the continental United States at risk with a nuclear weapon is Professor Patrick Porter. Uh, Patrick's the Professor of Strategic Studies at the University of Exeter and a Senior Associate Fellow here at RUSI. Um, and speaking against the motion is Alexandra Bell, who you will notice is not Timothy Stafford on your program. We've got to give an extra thank you to Alex uh, today because she stepped in on, on last notice uh, when Timothy uh, informed us last week that he wouldn't be able to make it um, because of extraordinary circumstances. So uh, Alex is uh, jumping right in and uh, she brings with her some really significant experience that uh, will add to the debate here. She's the senior policy director at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. Uh, and she was previously the Director of Strategic Outreach in the Office of the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security at the State Department. The way we're going to uh, roll this afternoon is the following. Uh, we're gonna hear seven minutes of opening statements from each of our two uh, speakers. This is on the record, actually the entire of the debate today is gonna be on the record. Um, so they'll present their opening remarks. We'll then give each speaker the opportunity to ask a challenging question of their opponent, um, and they'll have three minutes each to respond to that. And then we're gonna turn over to you for your challenging questions to the debaters. We'll take about 15 to 20 minutes of those, and then we'll give each the time for some concluding remarks. And with that, um, we're gonna start straight away with Patrick. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, being the son of a preacher man, I can't resist a pulpit uh, or a congregation. And the subject of my sermon is whether the United States and North Korea can have stable deterrence relationship after, if and when, Pyongyang acquires a deliverable intercontinental nuclear bomb that can strike the U.S. mainland. This matters to us all. If Los Angeles falls within North Korea's range, then so does Melbourne. So Mr. Jong-un, if you're tuning in, you've got my attention. This is about bad choices. And I wanna make three simple points. Firstly, North Korea's bomb is a reality. We should learn to live with it. We can create a stable deterrence relationship through mutual restraint and compromise. This has risks, but the alternatives to this are reckless. Either higher risk, unstable deterrence, or preventive war and no deterrence at all. So the key concept is stability. What do I mean by stability? I think a deterrence relationship is stable if neither party has or perceives an incentive to change its force posture out of concern that the adversary might use nuclear weapons first in a crisis. Stability does not mean perfect stability. It does not mean absence of competition. And it does not mean forever, but it does mean for meaningful periods. North Korea and the US already have a deterrence relationship. Both are concerned for survival. Both can credibly hold at risk what the other one most values. The US can obliterate North Korea, and North Korea knows it and, it, and it chooses to be deterred in order to assist its own survival. That's one of the reasons it hasn't started a war in six decades. North Korea can strike Seoul, and US bases in Guam and South Korea and Japan and America knows it. Both believe that the other has the capability and intent to respond to first move aggression above a threshold and inflict unacceptable costs. North Korea shows no sign of being willing ever to give up its, nu its nuclear and missile program. It identifies them with regime survival despite sanctions, despite threats, despite talks, despite outreach to China, despite even presidential tweets and despite the attempts to impress them by bombing third parties. They simply do not want to go the way of Colonel Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein. So far, the skirmishes have been limited. The crises have ended with cautionary behavior. Both sides have abstained from large-scale conventional war. Deterrence has held, but it is destabilizing as we speak. North Korea is going for an intercontinental bomb. America is determined to prevent it, and spiraling insecurity means that accident, misperception, overconfidence, or inadvertent escalation could take them to the brink and even trigger a wider crisis of American credibility and even an arms race in Asia. So how can countries stabilize deterrence? It takes political will. Both sides have to choose to be deterred 
and accept a degree of vulnerability. It takes credibility. Both sides must be confident that the other's nukes are survivable, yet that the other side will choose to remain deterred and not use them first. And it takes, above all, statecraft. Stability is not automatic in nuclear weapon systems. Nukes can destabilize relationships, risk inadvertent or accidental use, and especially when arms uh, competition get, gets mixed up in other enmities. So it requires constant work, communication, and signals. To achieve enough stability, both sides must neutralize or at least alleviate the security problems that could breed conflict in the first place. I want to suggest now a process of steps, some of them modest, some of them less modest, that could, over time, reciprocally stabilize the relationship. First of all, would be to try and move on to a more normal diplomatic footing, if that's possible, starting quietly with back-channel talks, with liaison officers in capitals, moving eventually to higher-level dialogue. There would need to be a rhetorical shift on both sides, abandoning the rhetoric of extermin extermination or regime change refraining from nuclear threats and moving towards a sole purpose declaration. That is, not renouncing first use, but announcing that the only purpose of the nuclear arsenal is to deter the use of nukes against oneself or allies. It would also require hard action, signaling actions, scaling back or suspending US-UK military exercises, refraining from expanding the TAD missile defense system, altering the overall military posture, emphasizing a counterforce rather than sorry, em emphasizing counter-value rather than counter-force targeting, and signaling the acceptance of the survivability of the other side's capability, lowering the fears that the other side might preempt. North Korea would have to give up much as well. For it to increase its chance of survival, it would have to abandon its game of making threats to achieve concessions. It would have to refrain from provocations and wind down the selling of nuclear materials on the international market. All of this would have to be reciprocally linked with phased lifting of sanctions and with some luck and some skill and some courage to move eventually to negotiating with four power talks to actually finally end the Korean War. The US would need to accept North Korea as a de facto nuclear power and North Korea would have to shift its declared goal to an eventual consensual and peaceful reunification. Now, the one big worry with all of this, apart from what I've just said, is the fear of what this would do to America's allies in Asia, the fear that by punching a hole in America's uh, nuclear umbrella, allies, particularly South Korea and Japan, would doubt the credibility of America's nuclear guarantees. And this, I'm afraid, would require America to coerce its allies. It, would, it could do what it has done before in the case of West Germany, in the case of Taiwan, and that, and that is apply coercive pressure, to put it politely, on its clients to, ex, to, ex, to refrain from nuclearization against the threat of, a, of American abandonment. The threat of American abandonment is not just a liability, ladies and gentlemen, it's also an American asset. And this would be required in order to, pre to prevent this crisis spooling out, but I think it's worth it given the alternatives on offer. Now, this, not, any of this is far from ideal and not certain, but I do think it's better than the alternatives. Let me talk about two alternatives very briefly, one of which is the status quo that is gradually, increasingly turning the screw. Uh, where some are advocating now actually going further and harder and more ruthless and more risk-taking with, with coercion short of war. That is the idea that you coerce North Korea to abandon its nuclear ambitions and take it right to the edge, to cripple its finances, to expand missile defences, to neutralise its threat, in the confidence that North Korea and its major patron, China, would back down. I think this is an imprudent gamble. By taking North Korea to the brink, it might behave as though you are taking it to the brink. It could tip it over that brink. It could m cause North Korea to behave like a cornered animal, and it will also require a very dangerous level of coercion of China, which could lead to certainly Chinese non-cooperation and possibly pushback and cause a wider strategic dilemma in Asia. And if you don't like a North Korean ICBM, how do you like an expanded Chinese ICBM program? That's what we're looking at. It, the, wor the worst thing about turning the screw, however, is that it might work. It could succeed catastrophically to result in immediate regime implosion and all the attendant horrors that American policymakers hardly like even thinking about. Mass refugee flows, factional combat, civilian hardship, loose nukes, potential Sino-American collision on that peninsula, and even cautious estimates like by Jennifer Lind in a benign situation would require 260,000 troops minimally to keep order to keep the peace. The other alternative is war. The other alternative is to abandon deterrence, to choose not to be deterred, 
and to choose preventive war instead. And on every estimate of casualties and costs, this would be a cure that's worse than the disease. Most South Koreans also oppose it. They oppose preemptive strikes and favor more comprehensive engagement. And Americans don't want it. And a lot of the bellicosity coming out of the Trump administration looks more and more hollow in this regard. So to say that Washington should accept proliferation in North Korea's case is not to say that Washington should accept all proliferation. I'm a great admirer, great fan of the work the Obama administration did in reversing Iran's nuclear program. But crucially, that was peacefully reversible. This one is not. My final point, for those of you who are, who are skeptics, and I sense there are more than one or two in the room, recall another rogue state, the most roguey state that's ever been in American rhetoric, and that is Mao's China in the 1960s. Before Mao got the bomb, he killed millions, attacked India, fought America in Korea, armed the Viet Cong, threatened war over Taiwan, and bragged about surviving a nuclear war. He was, as the Hawks warned, an undeterrable, aggressive fanatic. But Washington, I think wisely, offered deterrence instead of coercion. They began covert dialogue. They eventually stabilized the relationship. China's nuclear posture became remarkably restrained, a tightly controlled minimal deterrent, and it renounced first use. China could have said no, and North Korea could say no, but Washington had the courage to give it the chance. This is not a test, ladies and gentlemen, of strength. It's a test of judgment. Given the poverty of the alternatives, not only is stable deterrence possible, it's the only prudent path, and I've always wanted to say this. I commend the motion to the House. Thank you very much. First, uh, I'd like to thank Pony UK and Rusi for hosting this very interesting event. Uh, second, thanks to all of you for enduring what will be a sort of quickly put together presentation. Uh, I'll also note that I'll be attempting to debate this uh, on my own behalf and not on behalf of my organization. Um, to set the scene, and Andrea sort of stole my line here, uh, on January 2nd, 2017, President Trump uh, tweeted, Quote, North Korea just stated that it is in its final stages of developing a nuclear weapon capable of reaching parts of the United States. It won't happen, exclamation point. Uh, since then, the North Koreans have conducted nine missile tests. When discussing the most recent launch, a North Korean official said the latest test would, quote, make a greater leap forward in the spirit to send a bigger gift package to the Yankees. That statement came despite the fact that the United States has around 4,000 uh, 4, nuclear warheads in our active stockpile and the greatest conventional military ever built. People in this room are generally predisposed to think that deterrence theory is sound. The problem with any theory is that its application in practice uh, is a little bit more difficult and the type of situation that we're looking at, an ICBM armed North Korea, would test the boundaries of the theory. Uh, in practice, stable deterrence requires three components, as we have heard earlier today, capability, credibility, and communication. We have problems with every one. In this scenario, the U.S. and DPRK would have the capabilities, but at vastly asymmetric levels. This imbalance will make North Korea more likely to respond to what it perceives as an American provocation with a nuclear strike, which they'd rather use than lose their nukes. Uh, that, in turn, would increase the incentive for American first strike to prevent the use of nuclear weapons or an uh, opening of conflict. Uh, the advantages uh, for either side for preemptive action uh, damages the possibility of stable deterrence. As I noted, President Trump has already drawn a red line, uh, as have previous administrations. Uh, in order to maintain credibility, the United States uh, has with our allies or really any country watching uh, we cannot accept a nuclear armed uh, nuclear ICBM armed North Korea. Uh, that goes doubly for a U.S. president who is overtly concerned with optics and a vocal caucus in the United States that tends to see military action as a preferred first option. Further, this will all be happening in a situation where North Korea will be more motivated to pursue conventional conflicts banking on the fact that the United States would be unwilling to escalate to the nuclear level. That challenge to the credibility of the U.S. nuclear deterrent might motivate our regional allies to pursue their own defense strategies, further weakening stability in East Asia. As former U.S. Secretary of Defense William Perry said, he is not concerned that North Korea would start a nuclear war, but that having nuclear weapons could make the unpredictable nation more willing to launch a conventional war that could uh, progress into a nuclear exchange. Finally, there is uh, 
an issue with our communications. Uh, during the Cold War, the U.S. and the Soviet Union watched and listened to each other very carefully. Uh, there were academic and governmental institutions devoted to studying each other's declaratory policies, our public statements, our budgets, our congressional and legislative arguments. Uh, we knew what each other were doing and saying we were also talking to each other regularly. That kind of communication was creating a balance uh, despite tensions in other parts of our relationship. This just doesn't exist with North Korea. We don't talk to the North Koreans. We don't know a lot about them. Dennis Rodman knows more about Kim Jong-un than any American diplomat. That's problematic. At some point, they should probably pull him in for a talk. Uh, but uh, we assume that Kim Jong-un is interested in regime preservation, uh, but he openly disrespects his patron state at this point. Uh, he was educated in the West. Some people were hoping that that would give us an opening to talk to him, uh, but he recently shocked the world when he uh, deployed a weapon of indis individual destruction on his brother-in-law using VX gas in Malaysia recently, or purportedly. Uh, this volatility is enough to cast doubt on a stable deterrent situation with North Korea in any political atmosphere. But now the U.S. also has a difficult to decipher president. And the lack of a consistent message from the U.S. administration is exacerbating instability in the regions. At times, U.S. officials have contradicted each other, uh, even themselves, within a matter of days. Uh, Interagency cleared policies at the risk of alteration should the president change his mind uh, with little or no warning. Uh, our departments of defense and state are currently understaffed. We still haven't even nominated a, an ambassador to South Korea. Um, this is creating a, a sort of a, a policy uh, and advice uh, gap for the president, uh, further kind of complicating a situation in a crisis mode if there were an ICBM in North Korea. Uh, so the lack of transparency, communications, coupled with the problems of uh, credibility and uh, capabilities make a, deter a stable deterrent situation impossible. That said, I think, just as a note, I think all these reasons also make a military conflict quite untenable. Uh, which is why I suggest the United States and its allies get to work to get North Korea back to the negotiating table yesterday uh, with an immediate focus on a freeze on the nuclear testing and uh, missile testing programs and then work from there. Uh, thank you. Great. Well, thanks very much to our two speakers for their opening remarks. I'm going to give each of you the chance to pose a question to the other. Um, and if I can, just maybe to, to frame what I gathered from, from both of you, there's actually a little bit of overlap in your positions in the sense that mm. both of you agree that communications mm. um, between the two countries are currently uh, insufficient and at an un have an undesirable character because they're not happening. Uh, similarly, you both agree that military conflict is uh, undesirable and untenable also. Um, now I think the, the key question comes down to whether or not you believe that even if uh, we were talking with each other and we had agreed that military conflict to prevent an ICBM on North Korea uh, was off the table, whether we could have a stable deterrence relationship in that environment. So I'd, I'd be keen to draw you both out on, on that point. Uh, Patrick, did you have uh, a question that you wanted to throw Alex's way? Sure. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, so when I was preparing for this, ladies and gentlemen, I rather assumed we'd be talking about a rather overindulgent, tyrannical, uh, sort of despotic character with a rather relaxed attitude to making nuclear threats, and, and so we are. Uh, you mentioned Trump, um, and in a way, I think where we, oh, sorry, I'm going to try and make this reasonably concise. In a way, we sort of agree that on current settings, it's not working. The question is, that what we're disagreeing about is, I'm more optimistic, you're more pessimistic that constructive change is possible uh, without or with a major shift in policy. If I had said to you during the election campaign if you'd known in advance that Trump would become president, if I'd said to you that this candidate who had threatened to shred alliances, tear them up, obsolete, 
had threatened to tolerate nuclear proliferation, even eat burgers with, with other tyrants, uh, who had threatened to destroy the relationship with China. If I told you that, in fact, this president, as alarming as he might be, has done has done, taken a much more orthodox position on NATO than people expected. Not the, exactly the same orthodox one, but demanding they spend more rather rudely, saying rude things, but reaffirming NATO. If I'd said that he'd come back to the one China policy, uh, if I'd said that he went to the Gulf to enthusiastically reaffirm alliances and partnerships, wouldn't that then give you some pause to think, well, if he's capable of changing on those fundamental areas, then maybe he's also capable of entertaining the idea of a more stable relationship with North Korea? Alex, do you want to take that and then you can sure. lob one back sure. at Patrick? Sure. Uh, I, uh, I, I think that the problem inherent is, uh, is that he keeps changing his mind. Uh, and that sort of inconsistency creates uh, concern among our allies. And, uh, you know, even if he changes back to a position that people find, you know, more kind of consistent with previous policy, um, there's nothing to say it won't change again. Uh, and I think you see that a little bit with, uh, with the way that we've been talking about North Korea as far as what we could do at times. All options are on the table, and then immediately after, except for diplomacy, that's not on the table unless they give up their entire nuclear program. Well, I don't, under hmm. I don't understand how you would negotiate to get rid of their nuclear program by demanding that they give up their nuclear program before negotiating. Um, so I, I think it, I, I would hope that the, the better angels in his administration are, are influencing him. Um, I also think uh, that time really isn't on our side because, because he sort of laid down that marker about an ICBM. Um, I am sure that people will remind him that, that he did in fact say that. Uh, uh, that said, uh, again, I, I think all of this is avoidable if we can simply steer folks in the direction of, of going back uh, back to the table as quickly as possible, uh, possibly, you know, something quietly at first just to see what, what is there. Uh, but once, uh, and so this will go into my question, is if they get an ICBM, do you think there is enough time to implement the kind of action plan you were talking about before there is a mistake or a miscalculation or, you know, a provocation that leads to conflict? Yes, I do. I think the thinking needs to begin now. Uh, in a way, we're already somewhere down the track to what I'm recommending, because as we've both agreed, there is no credible military option here. Not the kind of escalation risks the US is prepared to take. Even, even on his most unsatisfying day, Senator John McCain is not in favor of this. Right? So there's, there's already some basis there for accepting that this is, cannot be coerced out of North Korea in a direct way. There isn't a credible way of coercion short of war, because that could take you very quickly to the brink and would require a level of intensification and hostility with China that the US, even under Trump, doesn't want to entertain. So it, based upon those two realities, what do we have left? Well, do we, do, we, do we try and sort of hope that we can keep telling them to not have nuclear weapons and they keep ignoring it and escalating, or do we move to an acceptance of the bomb? Uh, again, I go back to the parallel with China and the relative speed of the debate in 1964 after China's uh, detonation, and how quickly policymakers could shift their ground. What, one thing that was really important about that is that you had credible people in the White House. Now, I don't claim Trump is generally credible, but he does have the political space to shift America's policy settings on North Korea because his right flank is covered. He has the domestic capital to actually make an about face. Yes, there'll be criticism. Yes, there'll be opposition. But it was much more intense in the 1960s with China, believe me. And that's what struck me about your reservations, which I share, is that all of the things you've said were also dynamics at play in the 1960s with China, domestically particularly, and yet deterrence held. So I think there Without is Without Twitter. <laughs> it was still pretty quick. Um, yes, I agree that the president can, can his Twitter rampages at 3 a.m., are not necessarily stabilizing the situation, uh, but <laughs> the telegraph, the telephone, the newspaper, mass literacy had been invented by the 1960s. So we're talking about a, deg a degree rather than substance. Uh, so even under the current suboptimal conditions, I think there, there can be a shift once we, once we openly recognize what is implicitly recognized in Washington, which is the unfeasibility of alternatives. Great. Get your questions ready. Um,
because we're going to come to you in case you have uh, areas and points you'd like to pick up on with our speakers. I'm going to throw two into the mix uh, and challenge you, Patrick, mm -hmm. on your point about the kind of plan going forward for a stable deterrence relationship with North Korea, which involved getting both sides to refrain from nuclear threats. Mm -hmm. And we've talked a lot about U.S. domestic politics. Let's talk about North Korean domestic politics a little bit, because I think that becomes a lot harder in the North Korean context, where that rhetoric is, has an audience in the Korean people to cement a, uh, a common uh, view and national identity based on external threats. Um, so I'd like to, to get your thoughts on whether or not you think that's possible to be implemented in a timely uh, fashion that the North Koreans can hold to because of their own domestic politics. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like to draw it actually from Matt's presentation here, uh, a second dynamic, um, which is that in the event that we get to a situation where we acknowledge in some form uh, North Korean nuclear capability as being a state we're likely to be in for some time, both of you identified that that would be problematic from the perspective of allies. We've already got allies here who think that is a real problem and who are determined to do something about it themselves. Um, in a world where allies do take more of that deterrence capability into their own hands, do you think um, that the multilateral relationship uh, is one that can still be stable? So I'll put both of those uh, points to you quickly. We're then going to come to you. Um, so I hope to see a lot of hands in a second. Well, thank, thank you. I, I can't do full justice to the complexities of North Korea's domestic politics, but uh, I'll have a go. Uh, I think that nor it, it is true that North Korea does thrive on a sense of emergency. It also thrives on a sense of international recognition, and there is a dynamic here where in exchange for lowering the sense of permanent emergency and high mobilization and threat, you get the reward of recognition, of nuclear recognition on a level, you get the reward of being able to say to the North Koreans, look, I've managed to get the much bigger beasts to tolerate, finally to tolerate and acknowledge our coexistence. But what's also important about that is crisis stability, nuclear stability, whatever you want to call it, is not the same thing as friendliness or absence of competition. Competition continues. They can still credibly say that North, North America would actually quite like regime change, would like us to liberalise, right? But then again, they can say with the, with the gradual phase lifting of sanctions that they can take credit domestically for making them richer. And that's an enormously powerful legitimizing tool, as China has shown, if handled carefully and slowly. So I think th there is enough scope there for, if you're worried about the narrative, for shifting that narrative. Did you want to pick up on the other point, Matt? Um, yeah, I, I think it just, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I think it just keeps going back to consistency and, and making sure that our allies are aware that, that we are there for them, uh, both in, you know, in, in all forms of deterrence that are necessary, conventional, um, and diplomatic and military and, uh, you know, stop talking about extended deterrence like it's a protection racket and, and something that, uh, that, you know, they're getting from us, that, that the actual, you know, outward extension of American forces is good for America and, um, and that working to get, you know, we, we just need to make sure that uh, they understand that this isn't something that we're going to take away from them if we feel like they haven't, you know, treated us properly, that, that we're in a, in a we're not their patron state, we're their ally. Right, we've got a number of hands here. Uh, we're gonna start here on the side and then we'll take that circle first and then we'll come over towards the middle. Malcolm will get the last word, I promise. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Stocker from the Institute. Um, the United States now has a modest but operational strategic missile defense capability, which was designed explicitly to deal with a future North Korean ICBM. So that gives Washington an option other than a threat of automatic nuclear retaliation. Um, or does that strengthen their deterrence ability vis-a-vis -vis Pyongyang, albeit through a uh, denial rather than punishment deterrence mechanism? So deterrence by denial. Who wants to start off on that one? Yeah, happy to. Uh, 
I think the difficulty with deterrence by denial threats and missile defence shields and all that is it, it, it's, it is very likely not to change the calculus in North Korea except for it to say we need to increase the pace, the quality and the quantity of our missile capacity to overwhelm those defences and that's the destabilising nature. Now, you can, ex you can accept that and so we can have a whole debate about whether that's a better posture for America to be in uh, but I think it does trade off strategic stability. And I'd also, like, I'd also sort of go with the line of Robert Jarvis, that actually small survivable arsenals do the job. I don't believe it's that significant that America has overwhelming nuclear capability. The fact that North Korea is, if it hasn't got enough already, will very soon have enough to make even Trump think four or five times about it, uh, then that will do the job, probably. So what do uh, missile defense forces look like in your stable, stable deterrence very relationship modest. with North Korea? Sorry, there's a bit of a talk about yep. <laughs> um, Alex, did you? Uh, yeah, sure. sure. I, uh, I, ballistic missile defense, uh, conceptually a limited ballistic missile defense, I, I think is something worth pursuing and, and talking about it. The system we have now is, is not a workable system. A 40% uh, effective, effectiveness rate on, uh, on tests in highly scripted situations is, is not yet a workable system. And, and I don't think that we should be selling it to the American public or our allies as, a, as a, something that is fully hashed and, and worked out. Um, it's something that I think the research should continue on, but as that's happening, we need to deal with the present threat that exists, which is stopping the forward motion of, of North Korea into expanding its missile capabilities and its nuclear program and focus the lion's share of our work on trying to figure out a way to add pressure to effective diplomacy, the implementation of, of sanctions, et cetera, and expansion of sanctions and, and get them back to the table. Uh, the, the missile defense is is an important thing to research and talk about, but it, it's not going to help us with the problem that exists right now. Can I just ask as a follow-up to that, when you say we're trying to, both of us, both of the presenters here are trying to get North Korea back to the table, what's your aim in getting them back to the table? Is it just for, um, to have that kind of comms dialogue mm. that gets you to a more stable situation? Is it actually to roll back the programs? What's mm. the aim you're talking about in this? I. Uh, I preface this by saying that I am an absolute dot in the wool optimist. Uh, I just, I was born that way. I, uh, I can't really, I can't help it. So uh, I do think that there actually is some potential for trying to convince North Korea to change tracks. I, I don't think they'll just wake up tomorrow and decide to get rid of nuclear weapons. I, I think the first step, as I said, is, is a freeze uh, on their testing and, and missile program. Um, I think looking back at the lessons learned from the agreed framework and attempts after that uh, to, to get them to uh, cooperate in certain ways, what worked, what didn't work, looking at the JCPOA, uh, it's, you know, there, there are parallels, it's not the same exact situation, but, but we have a lot of knowledge built on that process that can be applied. I think it's important to, to kind of um, single out the nuclear program. Uh, there are a lot of problems uh, when it comes to North Korea, whether it's, you know, human rights, uh, regional, uh, Aggression, I think if we can sort of pull out the nuclear part like we've done in the past with Iran and with uh, the Soviet Union and then Russia, um, I, th I think that's the best way to start. Um, okay. Okay. We're going to go to an another question first. Um, here on the side again, did Jeremy still have the microphone? Because if not, I could just pass it on. Hi there. Ian Ripoff from AWE. Uh, from both panelists at the moment, it seems to me that a lot of the focus is that the capabilities. Uh, North Korea would have capability in the very near future and as a uh, weapon, uh, defense contractor developing such a nuclear weapon system is not let's say a short quick process and whilst they're close to it they may not get there prior to Trump being impeached or a, a change of administration by natural causes. <laughs> so how would your stances change if there is a different administration in place, perhaps more moderate, perhaps more predictable, and also recognizing that Kim Jong-un probably isn't going to change in the same sort of time frames. Great question. Who wants to start on that? Um, Do your positions change? Yeah, no, I actually, uh, I'm thinking that perhaps there would be a, a different administration now that the, the idea that I was talking about, about trying to look at the lessons learned and what had and hadn't worked and, and try to figure out how we can get them back to the table, that, that was always something I was thinking about anyway. Um, I, I think there's more concern because of, of the, uh, like I said, the, the sort of, um, the newness to these issues that this administration tends to have and, and the fact that they haven't staffed up properly and don't have, uh, I think, adequate leadership advising them on, on paths. But, um, you know, I, 
I am hopeful that they will get there or that any administration would look at this is this is a, a problem we can no longer ignore or assume will just sort of go away um, and, uh, you know, take the steps necessary. I, I think everybody, it's like the, the thing you hear at every single conference in D.C. of like, we should lean on China to get them. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's everybody's solution. And while I think that's important, we should also be looking at the fact that China's uh, influence on North Korea is, is sort of limited. So maybe it's instead of trying to influence China, talking with China about what we can do together. Uh, I think the nature of the dilemma is the same, whoever's in the White House. It used to be the case that Western diplomats could say to the diplomats of countries that were latently nuclear, look at Libya, you can come in from the cold, you can disarm, you can join the Fellowship of International Nations, you can trade with us, you can send your family to the LSE. <laughs> Consider now the force of that example. That's the structural situation we're in, where North Korea has every rational incentive in the world to ensure that its nuclear deterrent is uh, not only robust, but is deliverable and is secure. So I don't think it actually matters that much who the president is in terms of the ultimate nature of the situation and the narrow range of choices ahead of them. A, a, a determination to inhibit nuclear, nuclear proliferation is common to every just about every US president for the last few decades. It would be the same dilemma facing Obama and the same narrow range of choices. I think what, what really does matter as well though here, and this has come up a couple of times, is that is what's really at stake is not so much the fear of a escalation crisis between North Korea and America directly, it's what happens to American alliances. And I agree that alliances aren't a protection racket, but neither are they charity. America doesn't just have alliances as a gift to the world, it has those alliances in order to inhibit the militarization of other countries, like in South, South Korea, like in Japan. And actually, it, we hear a lot in Europe at the moment about the need to exercise leadership. Part of that leadership, occasionally, is telling your allies to get in line. There is a coercive side to America's primacy, which is about coercing allies not to become multipolar rivals. And I think they actually can do that. But the whole problem is, the way it's now articulated is, it's about America going around reassuring people with positive inducements. But also, I think there's a stick there. Okay, we'll do Rebecca and then here in the middle. And we're gonna take two at the same time, if that's okay, we'll bundle them. Uh, Rebecca Hurstman with CSIS Pony. So I guess my question uh, is principally for Professor Porter. If we all would agree that uh, stable deterrence rests on a credible threat of the use of force, um, we might agree, I think your presentation said, that uh, the North Korean regime may well not understand what the, the nature of thresholds. They will likely explore space below that threshold to try to determine. So I think we are likely to be tested. So the question becomes, why wouldn't we be better off um, threatening and being prepared to use force to encourage a much more coercive diplomacy prior to the deployment of a nuclear-armed ICBM, rather than the rather significant risk that we'll be pressed to use force in a post-nuclear ICBM world. Sure. Uh, we'll take the second question as well. Rebecca, if you just want to pass the microphone just next to you, we'll go there in the second round, so. Hi, uh, Ben Rayner, BS Systems. Uh, you mentioned in both your talks about um, the use of sanctions and things like that, but you also mentioned about missile tests currently ongoing. Um, have we not already employed a number of s severe sanctions on North Korea? I was just wondering how effective do you believe sanctioning uh, individuals such as Kim Jong-un actually is? And could you send your microphone back uh, there to that side? Thanks. Right. On, on those questions, uh, Alex, let's start with you first. On the sanctions, um, implementation could be improved. Uh, you know, there have been no shortage of uh, think tank experts and government experts looking at, at how uh, the, implement, uh, the sanctions that are currently in place could be expanded um, and better implemented. And whether that goes to uh, better control of uh, banking in the region, um, you know, better control of interdiction, uh, shipments in and out of the country, uh, it, there are things that can be done. Um, as with kind of any sanctions regime, the longer things are in place, the lazier people get and the more creative people get about getting around it, supply and demand being what it is. North Korea has money to spend and people are gonna figure out how to get things inside. So uh, we have to be constantly looking at the ways to both 
uh, fill up the, the holes and the gaps uh, through which um, illicit substances are, and materials are getting. Um, but I, I just, you know, we're uh, a, a bunch of smart people in this community. We've got good leaders. I, I, I have a hard time thinking that we've exhausted uh, the limit of our creativity when it comes to, to putting pressure on North Korea. But I do think you need a, a way out. There also needs to be a, a clear uh, path to the table that, that this is going to continue to happen unless you come over here and start talking with us and have real discussions and, and you know, get over this idea that, uh, you, know, cert, you know, we're not going to talk about your nuclear program. That's going to be on the table, but we'll be able to discuss other things as well. I, I, we're, we're creative. I think we can find some stuff. I think and building on that and, and the question, um, the difficulty with that is that it takes a level of diplomatic skill which is superhuman, given you're telling North Korea at the outset that you don't want their nuclear weapons program to exist. I think constructive dialogue and stabilising a whole lot of areas of the relationship will be made infinitely easier by accepting their nuclear program. Not necessarily as legitimate, but as a, as a reality and as a fact of life. The, the question you asked about uh, testing and thresholds, I think that's more likely in an unstable relationship the point about a stable nuclear relationship is that there is still a very credible threat that makes that complicates the calculations of them. So it may be that they do try and probe, but it would be more likely to be a, a, below a very certain threshold. So there would be some competition, there'd be some risk. You're absolutely right. There is no risk-free option. What I'm offering could still lead to catastrophe. But if we go to the, my goodness me, if we go to the alternative of, of turning the screw to take them right to the brink, so that we're actually, someone said the other day in foreign affairs advocating this policy, we need to make clear that we'd rather they collapse in chaos than them develop nuclear weapons. Well, when North Korea hears that, and we heard about soft power, can you imagine the response to that, that you actually are, you've moved from threatening their survival to actually threatening their survival, not just rhetorically, but doing it. So I think what I've outlined is very imperfect, but you've got a much better chance of <coughs> confining such competition as there is below a, a very low threshold, which we can, a high threshold, which we can live with. Okay, two more questions here, and then Malcolm, I think you had one. Do you still have one? Yeah. Uh, James Hayes, MAD. Um, you analyzed through the, the three Cs. Uh, I postulate that uh, Kim Jong is absolutely getting the last C absolutely right, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it today. Um, and that makes me think, what's his motivation in this? And Patrick quite rightly said he's acting rationally. Uh, so if I postulate the scenario that he is acting rationally, he cannot win a conventional war. So what are his options? His only real option is to develop our nuclear capability, to develop some form of status quo. So my question to you is, what do you think is Kim Jong's motivation in this? We've talked all about Trump. Well, there's two, two got a tango here. Um, and is that motivation stability as the goal, or could it be something beyond that? Can I just ask you, um, maybe for the benefit of the audience as well, to draw what you mean by when he's getting the communications absolutely right? What is it about that that you think um, is? What the postulation there is that if, if you believe the postulation that he, his aim here is to develop a nuclear capability in order to redress his imbalance in conventional capability um, by signaling, getting Trump to jump up and down, getting organizations like this excited about isn't he actually getting his messaging spot on? Great, thanks. So I think it's a fine line. Uh, he does want, I, I agree with you, that there is an element of wanting to generate constant attention and emergency below a certain level, and that runs a risk of that going out of control. So there's a sort of, there's a deliberate brinksmanship there. Look, it's possible to say and to ask North Korean experts and Korea watchers, and they'll find all sorts of complicated and rich motivations. That there's all sorts of things he wants. There's family stuff, there's regime stuff, there's society stuff. But I think the, the most important baseline for him and for almost all regimes is survival in a hostile world. Hostile domestically, hostile internationally. And the gambit that they are running is that uh, apart from securing a nuclear retaliatory capability is to achieve all the prestige that comes with that and all the sense of achievement that comes with that. And I'm sure there are elements of the regime that are quite deeply eccentric, but that is not eccentric. Yeah, I, again, I, I haven't talked to Dennis Rodman, so uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not even sure. I, I, you know, there are rarely even occasions where you have sort of even anecdotes of what he's like. I think in public he tends to deliver speeches and, and that's it. Um, you know, he's a 27-year-old uh, 
man who is lived basically in isolation his whole life. Um, I would, even so, uh, I would say regime stability is his goal. Um, and if our goal is to reduce the nuclear risk, then we have to figure out some way to make him at least feel um, somewhat assured that, that we're not trying to trick him into the table if only to overthrow him, that, mm. that, that, that our motivation is to primarily and, and most importantly reduce the nuclear risk first, and then, and then we'll have some conversations about him you know, and North Korea rejoining the international community, but he needs to feel some sort of safety at the table. Malcolm. Thanks, Andrea. And I, I think this is a marvelous example of how a pony we can put a really difficult issue on the table and unpick it in a way which I think is very illuminating for all of us here without coming to, to an answer. But can I just come back to Patrick's image of Trump to Pyongyang, uh, the, the parallel of Nixon going to China. After China got a bomb, the Americans reached out to them and you had had for the last 40 years. And, and really, partly ask Alex, in response to your last comment, uh, given the need to have some reassurance of Pyongyang as part of the process which you accept, would you go as far as Patrick in terms of the sort of things he's talking about in terms of the broader political relationship, a peace treaty, and all this sort of thing? And to Patrick, <laughs> do you see that broader political as an essential element in a stable deterrent relationship with North Korea. Isn't it the reality that deterrence doesn't need agreements? <laughs> deterrence has been between countries that, tr that distrust each other mm -hmm. so deeply they're prepared to contemplate nuclear <coughs> attack on each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so why, uh, why does a deterrence relationship need an agreement? Uh, and indeed, uh, might there not be drawbacks to be seen to be uh, rewarding a nuclear risk-taking behavior on the part of North Korea uh, with a political agreement. Wouldn't it be a better to accept we may have to have a degree of mutual deterrence, we have it already in relation to South Korea uh, and perhaps Japan, maybe it's better to accept deterrence without an agreement. Thank you. Patrick, you first. Okay. okay. Uh, you can, yes, you're right. You can have you can have a stable deterrence. You can have a, a deterrence relationship between an, between antagonists who deeply distrust each other, have very little other relationship, but who who trust in the raw logic of retaliation and punishment. You can have that. I think it is much much less fraught if you also open a wider political conversation going. It doesn't mean that that erodes all distrust, but it does relax existential fears. And if you can relax existential fears, that for whatever else is happening, it's increasingly implausible the other side is going to try and take us out. Then you create space for creating a different kind of relationship uh, where uh, there is an overall less likelihood of an inadvertent escalation. Uh, and there, there are also uh, sort of cases in between, like India, Pakistan, with great familiarity but also great distrust, where if you look at the, the way they've worked very hard to stabilise over between 1999, the Kargil War, the 2001 attack on the Indian Parliament, the Mumbai, the Mumbai bombings, the way in which actually very, very fraught and difficult situations didn't lead to inadvertent escalation because all the work was put into signalling there. And I think that, that is certainly possible as well, um, in, even, even between partners like America and China, America and North Korea, that have historically distrusted each other. Yeah. Alex, did you want anything on that? Uh, on the, the other point about going back to, uh, you know, beyond just a nuclear agreement and peace treaties, um, I think... Uh, there tends to be a problem, uh, an idea you see at times where people think you get a treaty and then it's done and you can sort of walk away and you don't have to uh, tend to it, upkeep it uh, with the agreed yeah. framework in 1994. Um, I'd like to posit that we had something good going on there and then it started to go badly and instead of figuring out um, with all parties how to uh, fix the problem in the agreed framework, we sort of just let it fall through our fingers and I think we've been trying to get back there ever since. Um, so I, I think in order to get down the road to, you know, the big issues, actually, you know, a peace treaty on the peninsula ending the Korean War finally, um, it's just going to have to, at the risk of using a term that people tend to hate now, a step-by-step -step process where, uh, you know, it, the freeze first, then dealing with the nuclear program, 
Um, I think that'll take a lot of time, hopefully build up the trust though, that we can then start having larger conversations about them rejoining the international community. But um, it, it definitely means that those initial steps will have to be um, you know, carefully tended and, and upkept and, and an understanding that North Korea is potentially not gonna be as good of an actor as we would want them to be. Um, but nevertheless, it's in our interest to keep them there. I think they're watching the JCPOA very mm. closely. Mm. And, mm. and if that agreement goes off the rails, I think that will make it very difficult to get Pyongyang to even listen to the idea of coming to the table. Uh, so yeah, it, uh, carefully tending of any steps that are working and that will get us down the road. Great, we're gonna wrap questions there, but I wanna give each of you two minutes to give closing pitches to the audience of uh, why either the motion uh, should or should not stand. Let's start actually in reverse order. Alex, do you wanna kick off on that? And sure. Uh, even though I think that uh, Patrick and I have a, a general violent agreement about what needs to be uh, done in, you know, in the future to fix this problem. Uh, I tend to think that because of the actors involved and um, because of the volatility of the situation, the, the quickness with which this, uh, this is moving, that should North Korea get an ICBM, that, that stable deterrence would be very hard to maintain. And um, the, the risk of miscalculation is just too high. Uh, once that's uh, in effect. So in, in some ways, as Rebecca said, dealing with the problem before we get there is the only way to deal with the problem um, in a way that I think that, that works for the United States and our allies. Uh, I think after the fact, it just becomes uh, more dangerous, more difficult to, to get out of the situation. So I, I just don't think stability can, can be maintained in the way it is sort of now uh, once an ICBM is in play. Well, thank you very much. Uh, rogue states with ICBMs, these are not new things. These are quite old things. And we've worked out pretty effective ways of coexisting, not without risk, not without crisis, and I'm not nostalgic for the Cold War. But what were the alternatives when the Soviet Union was testing its bomb? What were the alternatives when China was testing its bomb? And we found generally that they had a pretty primordial commitment like we do to surviving. And we accepted that principle against a lot of advocacy saying stop the problem before it starts. Is it perfect? No. Is it utopian? No. But it has, it has been something that our diplomats have achieved very painstakingly, with a lot of work, I agree, uh, for enough time for there to be enough evidence to say, for us to be reasonably able to say that this is a possibility. Uh, the risk of miscalculation is there. It's much higher if you try and forestall a North Korean ICBM. And just saying go to the table and start talks is not much good at all if the premise of your going to the table is that you're going to ask them to reverse the thing, the thing that they most identify with regime survival and they most identify as a guarantor against Western backed regime change. And that's the world we've handed to them and that's the world in which we both have to coexist. I noticed this week that it was the birthday of John F. Kennedy uh, and that a lot of all the kind of the normal quotes were trotted out and all that, so I'm not gonna do that. But he did say one thing that it was, caught, so it was quite a useful guide to the spirit in which this should be done. He said, uh, let us not negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. And, and to say that in early 1960s America was just as brave as saying that today. And I think that's the spirit in which we should approach this problem. Thank you very much. To sum up, I thought we had a, a fabulous debate here. We're going to take a straw poll vote in a second um, just to see where the audience falls on the, on the question. But I thought there was a really interesting area of convergence and uh, a notable one of divergence, but at a point perhaps I, I didn't expect. Um, so just to reflect on that. On the convergence, I thought actually um, both of the debaters converged around the importance of uh, communications as being something stabilizing. Um, for those of you that have read the works of Michael Quinlan, he would agree wholeheartedly with that um, assertion that we need to have a good understanding between adversaries of where vital interests lie, of where uh, lines that should not be crossed lie. Um, and I think both of the speakers also appreciated how difficult that is um, in this particular context. 
I thought it was also uh, noteworthy that while both of the speakers um, said that we had to take action now to improve communications, um, to try to get a dialogue going with North Korea to change um, and to rectify some of the issues uh, that are happening both um, in U.S. political terms, in the framing of uh, capability deployments and uh, assurance and deterrence messages, that nevertheless there was disagreement on whether or not, even if you took those steps, um, the future world uh, would look more, w would be stable um, or unstable in, in a deterrence relationship. And actually it seemed like, Alex, in your view, um, when you were spelling out those things that we need to do now, it was to reduce some of the instability, whereas Patrick described it as increasing the stability, and it's just a question of where we get to on, on either side of that, of that delicate movement in, in the way that this debate was framed. So let's take a quick vote uh, to see where you stand on the motion. Um, all those in favor, if you could raise your hand. So this House believes that it is possible to maintain a stable deterrence relationship with an ICBM armed North Korea. And those opposed? I would say in favor has it, but not by a huge margin, which is interesting that this is going to be a debate that continues in this community. So uh, I would just like to thank our wonderful speakers again um, for debating this very difficult question. I want to also take a quick minute to say a huge thank you uh, to the Rusi team for putting this event mm. together, and particularly to Christina, who's uh, jumped in the deep end with this conference in a truly spectacular fashion. Um, this is my, my seventh pony rodeo. Um, and as I remarked to someone uh, earlier, my least stressful because it's the first time I've not been in a coordination role, but nevertheless have deep appreciation of how much work goes into this. So uh, I hope someone brings Christina several glasses of free wine later, mm. <laughs> um, at least, and thank you. Um, so with that, uh, let's give a round of applause again to our speakers, and I'll give you then a few admin points. Thank you. So lunch is now going to be served upstairs. Um, I've been told that we all need to be back here at 2 p.m. sharp. You may sit at your own tables and make your own teams for what's going to be a quiz that I gather has some very good team names already sorted out for you. So uh, mix up a little bit, but a uh, free seating arrangement when you come back at 2 p.m. Thanks, Andrew, very much. Thanks. That was great, guys. Thank you. That, uh, I was like, I didn't do too badly for nothing.